Hey everybody, welcome. It's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on today. Very special show for you. One of the things I want to say, uh, Norman D. Ellis is joining me here today. And what I love about this is we're going to be talking about her fabulous book, right? Hieroglyphic Words of Power. Um, but we also have several things to give away today. We have copies of the book and you'll hear that she has a special gift we're giving away today as well. But when I thought about introducing her, award-winning writer, of course, workshop facilitator, teacher, it, you know, our arch priestess of the Fellowship of Isis, all of the things that we're about to say and talk about, what I was struck by today in reading her book and also getting ready to share her vision and message with you was something on her website. And it's, it's kind of ironic because if you look at what her passion is, her passion, and this is right, this is right from Normandy's website, the words and the world are my passions. And you know, once upon a time, if you would have asked me about the words and the world, especially the words, I grew up stuttering as a kid mm -hmm. and it took me going back to school in my forties to discover the words. And then of course, moving into the show in 2003, discovering that I could actually speak words in a way people are inspired. And I would have never thought that I would be talking with someone that lives an entire life in educating all of us about the mysteries, about the mysteries of the world and the mysteries of the word. And if I think about what Normandy says, I can only imagine, and maybe we'll talk about it today, I can only imagine what she thinks of the language slash the words that are being used in the world today and the symbolic mm -hmm. nature of them for thousands of years to come. But today we get to, this book is fabulous folks. I get to share and talk with her about one of my favorite topics. And you know, when I think about the book that she wrote, and I think about these hieroglyphic words of power, I am very struck by the imagery and I will share with you why in a minute. Normandy, it's great to have you here. Thanks, it's really good to be here, Pat. You know, um, part of the things for me as somebody that um, grew up stuttering, and I never put this together, but I, I read somewhere in your book. This is really fascinating for me. I had this epiphany as I was really going through your book again and doing preparation for today. And what I was struck by, and I think this has to do with what happened to me as a kid, because as a kid, right, I stuttered, but I was highly visual, right? Mm. I mm. really was attracted to visualizations and symbols and I think when 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 you stutter you pay attention and you hang on every word it's a really interesting thing so as I went through your book I was so drawn to the imagery and I wanted to ask you the words in the world are your passion how has that journey been like for you well, great. I love that question. First of all, I want to say when I was a child, I stuttered too. Oh, did you? <laughs> I did. Um, and I, it never occurred to me until you just now said it, but that I could see what I wanted to say, but I couldn't That's find it. the word for it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so what I ended up doing was becoming kind of a loner. And I would uh, go down to this place that was near the, a little spring at the edge of the woods. And I would go down there and 
crawl into the storm sewer with my chalk and I would draw pictures and write poetry on the walls. You know, I, who knows if I was reenacting some ancient lifetime in which I was a scribe, I don't know. But that really was one of the keystone events of my life. And when I started to write um, and I would start typing, the Freudian typo was always word and world. They never came out exactly as they were supposed to because they were connected to me. They were just like that. Yeah. You know? And um, <clears throat> we were talking about astrology a minute ago, you and yeah. I. It's ninth house. That's publishing the words. Ninth house is the world, travel, and it's all connected in that one particular instance. Yeah, and if you saw my chart, by the way, which you're going to, because I would love, and you so offered, I would love to really have you look at, you know, my solar turn. If you looked up in that, what is it, the top right quadrant, uh -huh. right? And everything mm -hmm. going on up there, right? Um, three or four planets in Sagittarius, two, three with the moon in Capricorn, all over there. It's fascinating. But one of the things that you said, and I wonder if this is the the power of what we're talking about, the power of your book today. You know, I didn't know that, you know, people like us that see things and don't necessarily quote C words, for example, right? they have some learning different description of it. And I didn't realize it till I went back for my graduate and doctorate. Because I was, get, I was on the verge of flunking out of statistics, because when they would put the formulas, I would see symbols. Right. So my brain didn't connect the formulas and the the beauty of statistics to the mathematical calculation. I saw symbols and messages. Good news is I got a tutor and I passed. But, <laughs> Good. That is really the good news. I'm telling you, I, I, I really had a hard time my first year. After that, it was smooth sailing because conceptually, a lot of what you do in research and in, in, in really taking an idea is highly creative. And I want to ask you about this. I looked at this book and I looked at what you did here and the messages in here are highly created, creative. And what I mean by that is, if you take a look one by one, and some people might, and you read it and you go through one by one, you get a, a, just a world of information. But when I look at how we are symbolically showing up in the world today, there's such a beauty in putting symbols, messages, and art together. Is there an ancient wisdom that is begging to be called forward now in the world today to help us that's a that's a really good question um and i think that the answer to that in brief is yes um we want to uh we have lived in a world that's highly analytical that is uh putting everything into a little box and trying to sell that little box to us, you know? And I think that the world is much larger than that. And the beauty of uh, the hieroglyphs is that they work in, you know, multiple ways. They are poetry written on the walls of the tombs and the temples. Yeah. Um, and I think about Ezra Pound, when he said, what made a good poem, he would say, uh, Logopia, Phenopia, and Melopia by which he meant Logopia was the word, the, the story that it was telling, the narrative of the, of the language. Uh, phenopia, like phantom, was the image of the language. It had to have imagery to it to be a good poem. And Melopia was the melody of it, so the sound of it. And um, I think that when you're writing and you're putting things together, those three things really are important for making something come alive for the listener, for the reader. Um, and, I, and I have tried really hard to make those things apparent as I was working. I started out as a creative writer, you know, and kind of wended my way back into mythology. Uh, but yeah. 
<laughs> I got to tell you, the last thing I ever thought I'd be doing is being here in a positive talk radio show and then starting a positive talk radio network. It really was not on my radar. It was nowhere yeah. on my radar. I mean, the, the idea of public speaking just, I mean, forget about it. I, I wouldn't sleep for a week. But something shifted in my life. And it'll be interesting when you look at my chart, you know, yes. to find out from you. But I started to notice more of the symbolic things in life. And I mean, visually symbolic. I don't mean metaphorically, like a metaphor. Like I'm really mm -hmm. struck by the imagery behind you. Right? Oh, yes. Right? So what happens with that is, and, and, and when I look at that imagery behind you, it really reminds me of you with your image. And then those wings are what I have other places of Isis. And I wanted to ask you about you this. You like that? Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that's cool. Now that's my blanket. I hung it over the clothesline to have a nice backdrop. Are you kidding? <laughs> that is gorgeous. Thank um, you. <laughs> but I want to talk about this because there are so many things in your book that have such powerful, powerful meaning. And I wanted to ask you, as you decided to write this book, mm. what was the driving mechanism? And I don't mean a publisher. I mean the spiritual draw. I mean the spiritual messaging. You understand? I don't mean publisher, write the book. I mm. mean differently. Right. I, I think what happened is that, well, first of all, I trained as a clairvoyant. And um, I teach in the metaphysical school at Camp Chesterfield and I work the platform as a clairvoyant. So I deliver clairvoyant messages to people, you know, on, on a regular basis. Um, and I began to see that there were images that were hieroglyphs were coming to me. It was as if I was looking at the walls, you know, and of course I lead trips to Egypt and, um, people would write to me and they would say, I had this dream about, you know, this particular wall and it had this on it. And so I was starting to say, oh, these symbols are getting into people's psyches. They're in mine for sure. And they mean something other than just I'm thinking in hieroglyphs, you know, <laughs> um, so many, so many people, I know so many women who have had breast cancer, who had to have mastectomies and put, um, the wings of Kephira or the eye of Horus on their chest. Those are two very healing images. The eye especially is very, very healing. But the winged being is the sign of protection. And it's the sign of turning something that's a negative into a positive. And what better way to do that than to put that on your body and say, I'm living this now, you know? So things like that have impressed me in terms of wanting to get this information out to people and to share it with them. And when we come back from break, Normandy, what we're going to do is I want to go through some of these. And the best way I know how to go through them is I have so many questions for you. I don't even know where to begin, but I'm going to let myself be guided today. Um, one of the things for sure is that words of power are so important. And here's the thing that's happening for me. Well, let me tell you when we come back from break, but I wanna to go to break. Benny, what I would love to do is let's give away our first copy of this book, fantastic book for those of you out there. And I'm sure Zach is gonna put the imagery up. Um, 1-800-930-2819. I would love to give away, uh, there are three copies of the book, Benny, any way you want to do it. 1-800-930-2819. When we come back, I want to ask everybody that's watching and listening, have you noticed imagery? Like, have you noticed imagery symbolically? Have you noticed something different now as, uh, Zach, beautiful, beautiful video there on Facebook. Good job. Have you noticed something? Are you drawn to something? Are shapes in your life changing perspectives of you? Mm -hmm. When we come back, we're going to talk about some of these amazing symbols in the book and the meaning for the world we live in today. I was especially drawn to 
the symbol for what we know in our world as Mary. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Yeah, Benny, good job on that. Really awesome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, um, we're going to go ahead. We've opened up the phone lines. We have three copies of the book to give away. I want to go ahead and do that. Uh, and those of you that are popping in on social media and just let us know uh, about um, if you'd like a copy of the book as well. Um, this is, for me, talking with Norman D. Ellis today. The book is called Hi Hieroglyphic Words of Power. What I love about this, and I wanted to talk to you about it when we came back, is I love that you're using the word power, okay? And what I mean by the fact that I say I love that you're using the word power is I think for a long time as women, we have been told not to use the word power or perhaps not to look at power or to be afraid of power. But this book is called Hieroglyphic Words of Power, right? Symbols for Magic, uh, Divination, and Dream Work. Mm -hmm. This feels like a time to reclaim power. And I have a show that I actually called, a, new, a different show I call Power Up with Dr. Pat. Tell me what the energy of that is and how the symbol, the symbolic nature of what you've put in the book really is calling this forward. Okay. Um, the translation of uh, the Egyptian word Heka, H-E-K-A, uh, we would translate it as magic but the ancient Egyptians called it words of power. And they, um, they used that as a way of saying it's how you, it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. It's the tone in which you say it. And it's the intention with which you say it. All of those things uh, have to do with creating a, words of power. And so it really has to do with being aware of how a word lands for your listener uh, and for yourself, if you happen to be using a word of power to pray or to affirm, you know, you want to use a word that's a strong visual. You want to use a word that's got your breath in it because it's the breath of God that breathes it into this language. Um, and you want to have your, your, uh, your personal strength, you know, like all your chakras aligned to get the energy flowing out. Okay, so, so that's your intention. The right words, the right sequence, the right intonation, the right intent, that creates a word of power. And that becomes a magical phrase or sentence. Um, the ancient Egyptians believed that that was how the world was made. You know, just like you know, you hear in the Bible, you know, God opened his mouth and, and over the water and the ripples created, you know, and that's the law of vibration. Um, the Egyptians had the same thing. God, the God opened his mouth and light sprang from his lips. And we, as God sparks, partake in that same power, those same words of power. You know, one of the things that I, I, I wanted to ask you about is how people when they get this book how people have responded to it i gave you an example during the break where i said i've had this book in my home and nor normally i'm in the studio but you know we're sheltering at home at least i am i'm the part of the team that's doing that and um and it's almost as if it was sitting there and i would read it but it kind of calls to me. And some of the symbols in, in literally opening up the book at a different page every time, right? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, this level of communication through symbolic uh, energy, it is so prevalent. Even today, what we're seeing is the symbolic energy of, of the masks we're wearing. I mm -hmm. mean, I have seen, and like just Jessica's grandma made me a mask, but when I take it off and I look at the artwork 
and I look at the the symbol symbols she used in it, I'm just drawn by it. Are mm-hmm. we developing, you know, symbols in our life today that that literally map to some of the symbols here? I think so, you know, and just the word mask, you know, because most often we talk about people who are wearing a mask as being untrue. You know, we have said that in the past, but these days the mask is an essential part of our nature. We must wear the mask. And I think that psychologically, that's a very different way of thinking about that word than we have ever thought about. And what we put on our mouths, we were just talking about how the world was created through the lips and the tongue of God, which the Egyptians called the lips and the tongue, the truth. Okay, what you what comes out of your mouth, what is over your mouth, you know, that is part of the message that you're giving people when you look at them, you know, so what you're wearing is actually very important. You know, um, I had a mask over here, I was going to actually put it on just for fun, and show you what mine looks like. I think, would you mind doing that? Sure, just a second. I don't have mine close to me. Okay, so. Here is my mask. You see? Yes. Okay. So it's got hearts on it and it's kind of like flowers growing and, and very, um, I like this mask. It makes me feel happy. I like its colors. I like the expression of the heart that's in it. Um, and that my mask is not scary. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I want to ask you, too, because there is a symbolic nature of what we're living through right now. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have seen artwork um, that symbolizes the words, you know, the language of COVID-19. I've seen art. But I want to ask you this question about the Egyptian mysticism, because more people, there are more people that I know that never have never gone to i've never gone to egypt have never gone to egypt uh the closest they've gotten to any version of anything egyptian is in the six different mummy movies the latest with tom cruise (laughs) right right which i thought was brilliant that was the best one but that and yet they walk into a shop or a store and they see something whether it's a piece of jewelry or a sta- something or a piece of, they see something and they're drawn to it. I want to ask you about the connection that we have with Egyptian mysticism and especially the way that you've, you've created an opening for us to understand through this book. Okay, I think this is Normandy's opinion. Uh, that the ancient Egyptians lived on the, this planet for 3,000 years that we know of, probably much longer than longer. that. Yeah. Their consciousness was imbued inside these sands that are Egypt now, which is a crystalline structure. And yes. I believe that their thoughts are captured inside that crystalline structure in the same way that You know, we send messages from satellites through crystalline structure that's up in the sky. And so all of those thoughts, consciousness is imbued inside of that structure. And we don't have to know what it means necessarily. We simply have to resonate with it and say, oh, that speaks to me, you know, and it is the consciousness of the past. Well, there's no past. It's all happening right now, you know. (laughs) Um, and I think that it's kind of the idea of quantum entanglement. If anything has been connected to something at one time, that is, if my soul and the God soul or the God spark have been connected, they will stay connected no matter how far apart they are. And I love what you just said. I love that. Did you say cosmic entanglement? Because that's what my quantum. brain... Quantum. What did you call it? Quantum. Yeah. Acute, like look quantum at where physics. I went to that. Yeah. Look at well, where I went. <laughs> Cosmic entanglement. You know, <laughs> but I think it is quantum. And I think 
And I want to talk to you about this because I think it's so very important. And uh, Benny and Zach, I'd like to skip this break if I could here. I'll break in a little bit. Um, it is hard and has always been hard for me, especially, look, if you stutter, it's hard for you to say anything. Um, but I think something happened to my brain because of that. And I mm -hmm. uh, haven't read about it. I couldn't tell you anything about it. And it was like I stuttered and then I didn't. And I don't mm -hmm. know when that was. And I cannot tell you when that was. But I did stutter for a long time. And you'll mm -hmm. hear on the show every once in a while, I will repeat myself or I will say without, with that, I, you'll hear me every once in a while. But I became so drawn to art forms and symbols. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in the graffiti, honestly, the graffiti center of the world New York, in New York. Right. And so the symbolism that I grew up with as a kid and I can't admit on air whether I participated in any of that, not going to say, but you could take your own bet on that. But I love the symbolism of it. I loved how each piece of the, the art was so representative. And I wanted to ask you, as you wrote this book, and you have now published this book, I wonder if this book brings forward a powerful message for a time from Normandy's perspective. <laughs> it, is, it is interesting to me that it has come out at this time in our, me too. In our world. Um, part of it is because we have slowed down long enough. I mean, maybe resistantly in some cases, but what's going to get us through is gratitude. And I think that looking at the world, um, as a thingly place, and I'm going to use that term because that's a term that uh, my friend, the poet Robert Kelly uses. He says that your writing and your vision of the world should be thingly. You know, it's not about when you see a word and you say, um, uh, like parameter, let's say the word parameter. Nobody can see parameter, right? It's kind of a word that we have to work to envision. But if we say the word window, we understand that because we know what window looks like, you know. And so if I'm giving you parameters for seeing uh, into the cosmos, if I am, and I'm speaking about when I worked at Ball Aerospace, I was giving people windows into, you know, what the Hubble Space Telescope was seeing. And so that was the way that I thought about it so that I would wow. present it in a different way. So I think now we're learning that we have to uh, express our love to the world. We have to see it with benevolent and compassionate eyes uh, in ways that we have never seen it before and to let, let ourselves open our hearts and be touched by what is in front of us. And I think that the hieroglyphs really teach us that. I want to ask you, um, as you think back on when you wrote the book, and you know, people that understand the publishing process, most people don't. Um, I know what it took for me to go through and edit and re-edit and then edit, then triple edit, then like, what, what did I even mean what I said? As you did this, I have two questions for you. What was your aha? Meaning, I know for me, every time I pick this book up, I am like, why? Why am I looking at that? What is the message in that? But did you have an aha? Was there one symbol or another that called to you personally? You're, you're having me confess something that I've not confessed on any other show in which I've done an interview. Okay. I know, but I, I so know that there's, I know, I so know there's something in here that I just had to ask you about. Okay. So the way that that book was written is that once it occurred to me that there were these particular glyphs that could be used in a, and I'm going to say an oracular way, 
Yeah. Um, I began to sit in meditation every day, every day. And I had an open notebook and I just let my guides write the book. I closed my eyes. I had no idea what was coming on the page. I had a finger going down the lines so that I wouldn't write over top of each other. And I would only write on one side of the page in case my ink pen ran out of ink so that I could you know, go back and mark it with a, a pencil and see what I had said. And I did that. And after I wrote it, I did not look back at it. I did not look back at it until all 60 glyphs were written. Wow. And then I went back and was like, okay, so now I know what they mean. And now I know what my guides want me to say about it. Now I have to make it so that it's my expression of it. I had to own it. So I had to go back and edit what came out sort of in a, a trance state. So that's how it was done. But, you know, there's a part of that that I so get, uh, you, you know, not from any intellectual perspective, but I could, ju I just had a sense of it. I had a sense of something here because it is so, um, how should I say it? it? The energy is so open in nature for, for me and it's very different than books that I've gotten before or looked at. Um, was there any one glyph that I, this I put, this is hot seat time for you. Um, was there any one glyph that called out to you in the final, final review of the book? Well, Hekka for sure was always there, was very much prominent. Um, and I felt very devoted to the, to the word Mary, to Mary. Yeah. Because yeah. it's the beloved. Uh, and it, and it occurred to me. M-E-R-I. M-E-R-I. M -E -R -I. And that is yep. every Mary in the Bible is a beloved, you know, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Jesus, you know, Miriam, uh, and the, um, uh, the Pharaoh's queens had those names, Mariamun, Mary you know, uh, Marin Ptah, the, even some of the Pharaohs, Marin Ptah had a name. That was the beloved of that particular god or goddess. Um, and I think that what I loved about the image is that it is a plow. It's a very simple plow, um, like the kind of plow that's drawn by a horse or an ox. I think it was drawn by an ox in the ancient Egyptian world is drawn by a horse in uh, Kentucky where I grew up, you know, um, and I could see when I was growing up, Wendell Berry was my poetry teacher and his wife's name was Mary. And he loved his hillside farm. He loved his farm. He loved the earth. He considered himself a husband of the earth, you know, and, and that the earth was as beloved as his Mary was. And that that was the real talk and relationship about being a husband of the earth. That's what a farmer was, you know, to take care of the land in the same way that he took care of his wife, Mary. And let's face it, she took pretty good care of him too. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, but that's one of those things that I think. I was drawn to it too. I mean, it's one of the, it, it was one of the symbols I picked up. And, you know, what's interesting about it too is that, you know, we're seeing changes in references, especially in Christianity and especially in Catholicism, mm -hmm. where I think, I can't remember which, all of a sudden had a shift on Mary Magdalene. Uh, mm -hmm. and right. it came out with, I, I can't remember what year it was, but it was a number of years ago, not very far from maybe I'd say five or six years ago when they changed the position of who Mary Magdalene was and basically demonstrated mm -hmm. that, wait a minute, she was an apostle with one else. Right. And I, I found that I don't, I don't think everybody is on the same page with that, but clearly that was, um, I want to ask you if you could pick one of these words of power to describe where we're going, not where we are, but where we're going. 
uh, in this world pick? today? Today. Yeah, I would pick Nefer. Um, and Nefer is, uh, Nefer is the hieroglyph of beauty. Um, and it is the, uh, it's a part of the construction of the name of the goddess uh, Sekhmet and Ptah. And it, um, his name is Nefertum, and he means the beautiful completion. And so I'm thinking about Nefer as being the way we're going now. Thinking about, um, though this has been a very difficult disease for most of us to have gone through, yeah. the world is recovering. The waters are getting clearer. The air is getting clearer. Uh, there's a lot of animal activity, you know, animals that have been uh, up in the hillside because there were people and they couldn't come down are now coming down into the cities and they're moving around more. I had deer pellets on my lawn today, you know, and I thought, <laughs> well, that's a good thing. You know? yeah. The deer are not afraid to come into my yard anymore. You know, there's no dogs out chasing them and I, the world is recovering. And I think that we took it for granted. One of the big things about the Egyptians is that they have 42, uh, they're called 42 uh, affirmations of ma'at or truth. And one of those, you say this affirmation, you know, I've not killed anybody. You know, it's like the Ten Commandments. But one of them is, I have not damned the river. You know, basically you're saying, I have not changed the course of the world in the way in which it was supposed to be and that's a really interesting thing that you know we have uh we have drilled we have blasted we have uh chopped and uh wended our way through the world without paying attention to the fact that everything is a sentient being everything the trees yeah. you know the leaves um, and so this is the way of the world recovering itself. And when it recovers, it becomes a thing of beauty. And so I think when we walk out of our houses again, that is what we're meant to see. Mm. There is a time that we're going through right now that is symbolic in its very nature, I believe. You know, as I as I really lean into this i'm mm. it, it, it is like some people say paradoxical some people say dichotomous uh some people say contrast some people say opposite to describe energies right mm -hmm. i i've never been a person of balance i don't get balance i don't understand balance but i do get harmony Mm -hmm. And so when I gave up my journey to try to be in balance and decided that if I put the pieces in my life together in a harmonious, integrative way, right, how did it make me feel? And so mm -hmm. I'm struck by how some symbols make me feel. I want to talk about two things in the short time we have left. Remember okay. I said to you, four symbol kept popping up right and it didn't matter yes. but there was one in particular that i am about i looked at it it stuck with me the imagery of it just can it's like it's on my brain now and it's in the book and it's called sahu s-a-h-u <laughs> yeah uh, i don't know if i pronounced that right but yeah, i wanted did. to ask you Many people will read this book and they will have similar experiences. I would love for you to help us to understand what the heck to do if and when we read the book. It's not going to be we read the book and maybe it'll happen and maybe it doesn't. It's going to happen. But we read the book and I don't know if I can show the image. Let me see if I can get it up here for Zach. For the moment. I don't know if everybody can see that. That's a who. Um, yeah. Completely embedded in my brain, in my heart. It's something, and I don't quite understand, even after reading this section like a lot. Can you help me okay. out with this? Yeah, sure. Let's go with the who first, okay? All right. Let's start with who. 
Who <laughs> <went> first? <laughs> um, that I know that that's part true. Of the hieroglyph is the um, spiral. Okay, that's the who part of the the hieroglyph, and who was considered the breath of God, and it was the first way in which we visualize anything. And it's, it is meditative. When we meditate, we breathe that air, the breath of God in. It, we hold it, and then it comes out through us. So who, um, if you've studied Eknar, who is considered the sound that the sphinx breathes out in the morning when the sun is rising? You know, who, who, who. Um, and so if you do these percussive breathing techniques like that. You can put yourself into a trance state in which you will visualize even more than you are right now. The second thing is that sa, it is more like a sigh, sa who. Okay, so sa, and again, I said it was about sound as well as image, right? And so the sa is that very uh, taking in feeling of something that's coming in. Uh, let's imagine it almost like traveling down your spine and then coming out again. A sahu is another word in the ancient Egyptian language for a spirit being, for a being that exists on an etheric plane and that comes down and works with us and visualizes with us. Um, sometimes overshadows us. You know, people talk about, um, you could say it's an angelic form. Sometimes it is. Um, and sometimes it's like uh, Saint Germain, you know, is a sahu. Um, the uh, hmm. pharaohs themselves believed that they could make themselves into a sacred sahu and be invoked and invited back into the world to do work. That was their intention not to scare people, but to do the work that the heavens, when they went up and saw the divine plan and the God said, do this, you know, like the angels and Jacob's ladder, you know, he sees them coming up and coming back down and the spirit beings come up and they come back down. And that's what the Sahus do. They're not ghosts because ghosts have a personal agenda. That's called a Kaibet. But yeah. a Sahu is spirit directed energy that comes up and comes down. Does that explain that? Yeah, it does. Because uh, when when I work with you and we worked uh, to, on my my um, chart, thank you for doing that too. I'd love to uh, talk with you about that. But the fact that it stayed with me so long, the imagery, and it's not not just one piece of the the symbol. You know, it's there's a complex nature to this that which is so beautiful to me. Right. Um, I want to just make sure everybody knows Normandy Ellis is my very special guest today. I want to make sure how do people get a copy of the book? Because I've got an advanced copy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They can go to get a copy of the book. They can go to Inner Traditions, to the website at Inner Traditions, or they can come to my website, which is uh, normandyellis.com, and there's a link there that you can click, and it will send them over to Inner Traditions. But if you're on my website, you also uh, can get a deck of cards that go with it, the Oracle of Sachet. It looks kind of like this. I don't know if you see that. Yep. There's the Goddess yep. Sachet. Isn't she pretty? Um, yeah. And so you can have your own deck of cards or you can make a deck of cards, um, which is here's another here's a shit in written in the deck of cards that's just hand drawn. So you can do it either way. I, I not only do I love I mean, this is for me, it, I'm like a, a, a kid in a sandbox, too, because there's so much that you absorb when you read the book, Normandy. It's, it's not like you read the book. It's like, I find myself not being able to read too much at a time, right? Mm -hmm. Like I mm -hmm. find that when I read it, there's a, there's a process of reading it and absorbing it. But I was really struck by, as I got towards the end of the book, there were layouts here. And yeah. I, I was really struck by this. 
can you tell us about that and how to use this? Because I found this fascinating. Sure. Um, say, for example, you wanted a astrological reading. You could go and you could look at this, the planets in the sky and look at all of that, but you could use these cards and lay them out in the exact same pattern uh, on top of it and get like extra information about it. Um, and so that uh, zodiacal ceiling layout, you can actually see that if you walked into the temple of Hathor uh, and looked, went up to the roof and went into this one particular room, there's an image of that ceiling uh, and, and the way it's laid out to, you know, where all the gods and goddesses fall. Um, huh. There are jet pillars in the, the temple of Abydos, which is like the tree of life. It's a tree that's truncated and uh, it's a pattern in which to lay out the cards that can tell you which plane is working on which your physical plane, your emotional plane, your mental plane, your spiritual plane. So a lot of those all work together. Yeah, I, I, I want to thank you for actually laying this out this way and doing this. Um, I, you know, I, I know this hour has gone by really, really quickly. Um, there are so many things and so many questions and so many things to talk about. Uh, but I want to ask you, as you reflect now in this show and you reflect on what we've talked about, um, what is the, the, the power of the message for us today based on these Egyptians, these hieroglyphs, you know, and, and how the messages are coming to us? What is your sense in the messaging for us as, as, as human beings? Well, the most important thing I think that the book is about and for us to know right now is that our thoughts are things where we yeah. put our intention is where what we're going to get back and there's ever so clear these days um what's going out in the world we have to pay attention to and to have an open heart to what we're seeing so um you know, as I think about this, and, and certainly we've talked about quite a bit today, um, has writing this book changed you? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, it's interesting to me because it feels like a conclusion. It took me 10 years to write the uh, to translate the hieroglyphs inside the Egyptian Book of the Dead to become Awakening Osiris. And this yeah. feels like a culmination of where those hieroglyphs have landed for me over the last 30 years. Yeah. Wow. You know, there's so much that, um, there's so much in here that I believe activates something so ancient in each of us right? You know, something that a DNA test can't give you, something with far beyond that, mm -hmm. you know, something that really touches parts of the heart that are with us and parts of our soul heart. Really? And that's so powerful. I, I just hope that we can connect with this because there's such wisdom. And by the way, possibilities, right? You know, there are uh -huh. possibilities and that's how we're getting to solutions today through possibilities and not probabilities. That's right. The infinite is at our fingertips. Yeah. Mm. What, we, what, what is your hope for the book for everyone? Oh, well, I, I hope that everyone who reads it, to tell you the truth, does as you do, which is to pick it up a little bit at a time and then digest it and to, you know, because I think that there's, there's much more um, for us to learn about ourselves when we pay attention to the images that appear in front of us. And I really think, you know, we haven't talked about how it's a dream interpretation book, but it certainly can be. Yeah, I didn't even get into talking to you about the dream I had about that particular glyph, hieroglyph, well, we you can know, the that. dream that came to me. <laughs> but I have to say, I know we've got two minutes left. It, it had to do with the, the work Jessica, myself and Terry did this weekend as we're creating our new initiative, which is called AI for the Soul. 
And it was an idea that came to us on a plane ride home from LA after doing a music video. And we were different. Jessica and I were different. We said it to each other on the plane. You know, I just looked at her and I said, I feel different. And she said, I feel different too. I feel inspired. And out of my mouth came, yeah, we have to create AI for the soul. And to be honest with you, what it, and I'm trying to get clear about it. But that dream with that symbol literally clarified for me what we are meant to create for the world yeah. through this. Yeah. And it's hard to explain that to people. Yeah, I I think that that's right. The the way that the image lands inside you is going to resonate in your life for, you know, the dream yeah. time it's going to it's going to pick up and and keep a resonance. Yeah. So Norma D. Ellis, and guess what? I hope that, you know, I will get on your calendar. I'd love to work with you. As I mentioned to you before, my astrologer, yeah, just decided not going to do it anymore. And then perhaps we can come back and talk about what you see. I've shared my chart, you know, before, but come back and talk about it, especially okay. as part two of what okay. we talked about today so that people really understand the depth and the breadth of your work oh i'd be i'd be delighted to do that that'd be fun norma d ellis everybody uh again uh you can go to her website normandyellis.com also we have a picture and we have a link and those of you on facebook you're going to get the video we'll make sure that um all of the above and as we move forward we will make sure we announce who the winners are for the very special gifts today. But well, for the most part, last question, what's your personal message, Normandy? What do you want to leave us with today? Open your hearts, express love, uh, do the best that you can possibly do for this world, and it will do its best for you. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, everybody, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with more of Guess What? The Dr. Pat Show.